It is not the strongest of the species that survives, nor the most intelligent that survives. It is the one that is most adaptable to change. A man who dares to waste one hour of time has not discovered the value of life. In the long history of humankind, and animal kind too, those who learn to collaborate and improvise most effectively have prevailed. Ignorance more frequently begets confidence than does knowledge. It is those who know little, not those who know much, who so positively assert that this or that problem will never be solved by science. A moral being is one who is capable of reflecting on his past actions and their motives, of approving of some and disapproving of others. If the misery of the poor be caused not by the laws of nature, but by our institutions, great is our sin. False facts are highly injurious to the progress of science, for they often endure long. But false views, if supported by some evidence, do little harm, for everyone takes a salutary pleasure in proving their falseness. Man selects only for his own good, nature only for that of the being which she tends. The very essence of instinct is that it's followed independently of reason. We can allow satellites, planets, suns, universe, nay whole systems of universes, to be governed by laws, but the smallest insect we wish to be created at once by special act. I love fools' experiments. I am always making them. To suppose that the eye with all its inimitable contrivances for adjusting the focus to different distances for admitting different amounts of light and for the correction of spherical and chromatic aberration could have been formed by natural selection seems, I freely confess, absurd in the highest degree. A dog running across a road alone is a miracle of faith. How does he know that men made those cars, and that men made those roads? It is always advisable to perceive clearly our ignorance. Owing to this struggle for life, any variation, however slight and from whatever cause proceeding, if it be in any degree profitable to an individual of any species, in its infinitely complex relations to other organic beings and to external nature, will tend to the preservation of that individual, and will generally be inherited by its offspring. Man with all his noble qualities, with sympathy which feels for the most debased, with benevolence which extends not only to other men, but to the humblest living creature, with his godlike intellect which has penetrated into the movements and constitution of the solar system, with all these exalted powers, man still bears in his bodily frame the indelible stamp of his lowly origin. Animals, whom we have made our slaves, we do not like to consider our equal. As natural selection acts solely by accumulating slight, successive, favorable variations, it can produce no great or sudden modification. It can act only by very short and slow steps. How paramount the future is to the present when one is surrounded by children. A scientific man ought to have no wishes, no affections, a mere heart of stone. When the views entertained in this volume on the origin of species or varieties conflict with other theories, such as the belief that man, for instance, is a separate creation, I hope that fewer illusions of this kind may be made. But I must refer to the theory of evolution by dissent, for this theory, as I believe, is accepted by all naturalists under the form of the dissent theory. I cannot persuade myself that a beneficent and omnipotent God would have designedly created parasitic wasps with the express intention of their feeding within the living bodies of caterpillars. Thus, from the war of nature, from famine and death, the most exalted object which we are capable of conceiving, namely, the production of the higher animals, directly follows. But I am very poorly today, I'm very stupid, imp. I hate everybody, imp. Everything. It is so easy to hide our ignorance under such expressions as the plan of creation, unity of design, etc., and to think that we give an explanation when we only restate a fact. What strikes me here is that he does not accuse the plan of creation and the unity of design of not being proper scientific concepts. At some future period, not very distant as measured by centuries, the civilized races of man will almost certainly exterminate and replace the savage races throughout the world. How fleeting are the wishes and efforts of man, how short his time, and consequently how poor will his products be compared with those accumulated by nature during whole geological periods. Can we wonder then? that nature's productions should be far truer in character than man's productions, that they should be infinitely better adapted to the most complex conditions of life, and should plainly bear the stamp of far higher workmanship. I have called this principle, by which each slight variation, if useful, is preserved, by the term natural selection. 
the expression often used by Mr. Herbert Spencer of the survival of the fittest is more accurate and is sometimes equally convenient. I am turned into a sort of machine for observing facts and grinding out conclusions. The mystery of the beginning of all things is insoluble by us, and I for one must be content to remain an agnostic. A mathematician is a blind man in a dark room looking for a black cat which isn't there. Great is the power of steady misrepresentation. I feel most deeply that the whole subject is too profound for the human intellect. A dog might as well speculate on the mind of Newton. Let each man hope and believe what he can. It is a cursed evil to any man to become as absorbed in any subject as I am in mine. If I had my life to live over again, I would have made a rule to read some poetry and listen to some music at least once every week. Believing as I do that man in the distant future will be a far more perfect creature than he now is, it is an intolerable thought that he and all other sentient beings are doomed to complete annihilation after such long-continued slow progress. What a book a devil's chaplain might write on the clumsy, wasteful, blundering, low and horridly cruel works of nature. There is no fundamental difference between man and animals in their ability to feel pleasure and pain, happiness and misery. There is grandeur in this view of life, with its several powers, having been originally breathed into a few forms or into one. And that, whilst this planet has gone cycling on according to the fixed law of gravity, from so simple a beginning, endless forms, most beautiful and most wonderful have been, and are being, evolved. A man's friendships are one of the best measures of his worth. The highest possible stage in moral culture is when we recognize that we ought to control our thoughts. Intelligence is based on how efficient a species became at doing the things they need to survive. The love for all living creatures is the most noble attribute of man.